Chapter 5, People, Preparing Practitioners for the Digital Zeitgeist. Quote, amateurs hack systems, professionals hack people, unquote. Bruce Schneier. Quote, my client took agile and corporatized it, unquote. Anna Kraft, Carney Partner. As evidence from the President Reagan assassination attempt, the Secret Service agents used their bodies as shields to protect the President. Obviously, that was not the best use of human assets. Bulletproof vests, better crowd control, and movement flows could have prevented the shooter from ever getting near the President. Today's supply chains have the same problem, as evidenced by the immense human capital invested to react to every disruption. Instead of deploying human assets where they're most effective, we have them doing work that intelligence and tools could be doing far better. Tasks like fraud detection, cutting and pasting data, manually importing or exporting data, track and trace, reporting, filling out, responding to RFPs, and so on. However, to redeploy our human assets, we need to better train them and create a culture that rewards useful work. The training fallacy. Error proofing versus upskilling. Quote, even turkeys fly in a hurricane, unquote. Peter Weiss, CIO and supply chain executive. Every year I'm forced to take a cybersecurity awareness training. Technically, I have to do it twice, once for Kearney and once for Norwich University, where I teach graduate history classes and direct capstone projects. These training courses are self-paced and delivered online through a learning management system. I look forward to this activity. I am curious to see how quickly I can get through the module without reading or watching any of the content. When one of the videos starts, I try to bypass it by moving the cursor all the way to the end with my finger or mouse. My record for completing the quote unquote training is three minutes and 27 seconds. If I can click through a training with minimal effort, that begs the fundamental question, why are we doing this pointless exercise? I know I'm not alone because I ask everyone the same question. I have yet to find someone who doesn't do some version of this. And if these trainings were so good, then ransomware wouldn't be such a significant issue. Despite the preponderance of cybersecurity training, ransomware attacks run rampant. It's reported that 76% of companies have been the victim of ransomware attacks in the past two years alone, and most of them have actually paid the ransom. In a shining example of how bad cybersecurity awareness is, Singapore's government technology agency undertook a test to see if they could get their colleagues to click on phishing emails. Some were written by hand and others by machine-generated algorithm. Shockingly, more people, by a significant margin, clicked on the machine-generated emails. This was by no means a definitive study, but it is an indicator of the efficacy of these tools when employed for negative purposes. If you choose to offer corporate cybersecurity training, proceed at your own risk. Here are some highlights, or lowlights, of what one can learn from common cybersecurity modules. 1. Phishing tricks users into providing sensitive information to cyber criminals via email, text, WhatsApp, or other media. 2. Hackers use various techniques to trick you. 3. Phishing is associated with virus infections, ransomware, identity theft, and data theft. 4. Attackers may also use your computer to attack others. Now, here's what users are supposed to do. 1. Take a close look, examine carefully, be suspicious. 2. Falling victim to phishing can be avoided if you give emails and requests for information a close examination. It pays to be extra cautious. 3. Each part of an email is a decision point. 4. Look for red flags relating to the sender of the email. These anecdotes are merely descriptors of what to look for and what to do if you find it. They are patently obvious to anybody who consumes news, social media, or warnings from big tech providers. Nothing in these statements is wrong. In fact, they are technically correct. Unfortunately, they do nothing to make us any safer than we were before we took the module. These course excerpts represent a key differentiator between learning digital and doing digital. Specifically, these trainings are geared to the least common denominator of risk, email, and collaboration platforms to maximize audience applicability. The glaring problem is twofold. First, what about the other threat vectors that are not email or collaboration tools, such as social engineering or fake websites? 
Second, each of us uses a wide variety of messaging platforms in a typical day, and the threats within each are unique. For example, I will log into four different email accounts, five collaboration platforms, and countless app-specific messaging platforms in the course of a day. And that's just me. There are numerous other platforms I don't even use. So how can 15 minutes adequately prepare me against all the possible threats coming from all of these applications? More importantly, with the rise of sophisticated innovations like natural language generation, machine learning, and large language models like ChatGPT, many of the learnings and recommended actions in the trainings don't hold up. A recent study found that, quote, advances in natural language generation have resulted in machine-generated text that is increasingly difficult to distinguish from human-authored text, unquote. The authors say that the application of these technologies is getting so sophisticated that each message can be auto-customized for each target and can spear fish at scale. If that doesn't scare you, consider that ChatGPT is already being used to create spam and ransomware. That means that all the cyber training that teaches us to look for red flags is useless because the red flags no longer exist. Setting aside cybersecurity, there are broader educational concepts at play when we look at corporate training. Research into memory retention shows that when presented with new material, we instantaneously lose 70% of it. Without a structural intervention, the remaining 30% mostly slips away over the next month. So the goal with training is to slow the process of forgetting. Imagine all the in-person training days, lectures, webinars, podcasts, and learning modules we've taken. Think about how much of that information has evaporated from our collective consciousnesses. Educational researchers point out the fallacy of corporate training. Quote, science proves that our brains can't retain information and knowledge by watching videos, reading manuals, or listening to hours of training sessions over Zoom, unquote. Why then are we engaging in corporate learning programs that are built on the idea that exposure to a material and pretend engagement, such as rote quizzes, teaches us something that we will retain? The annual cyber trainings I take each year suffer from these delusions of learning. The most egregious problem with corporate training is the pursuit of errorless learning. Companies need to attest to customers, clients, board members, regulators, and even the public that they are compliant with whatever competency, be it cybersecurity, ethics, ESG, and the like. If a company can't show mastery of a particular topic like cybersecurity, then how can it attest to being secure? So all the material and testing is constructed to create no errors to prove sufficient mastery of the topic. Unfortunately, this ensures that no meaningful learning occurs because enterprising users can simply bypass the training with minimal effort. Replacing training with actual learning. To move beyond corporate training busy work, we need to apply five pedagogical concepts that move us towards teaching people. Learning must be social, failure-driven, provide time for reflection, generative, and have personal meaning to the employees. In the context of digital, we need to apply these five concepts in a practical, hands-on manner, often referred to as experiential learning. 1. Training must be social. To effectively train people on digital, we need to enable it as a social and cultural activity. Educational researchers have established a definitive link between learning and social activity. They explain that the brain is an implicitly social organ that technically learns from interactions and environmental stimuli. In fact, the brain craves interpersonal stimuli as a learning channel. This is why in-person meetings and trainings can feel so much more useful because the brain is constantly being activated and absorbing information that is not available on a conference call or Zoom meeting. As an example, consider my friend Mike Kaju, who went down, and I mean way down, the blockchain crypto NFT rabbit hole. He learned the basics pretty quickly on his own, but sharing with me and the following discussions and predictions of where this technology could go spurred the learning for him. I knew even less than he did, but the social connection made me want to learn it with him. The amount of time we spent discussing this and the number of text messages were voluminous. But the shared learning experience and excitement took us further than we could have ever done individually. We're now experiencing the dynamic of social learning with the explosion of generative AI. ChatGPT and its antecedents have been around for a few years, and the public took very little notice. But once it entered popular culture, it seems as though we can't go five minutes without someone referencing it or creating LinkedIn posts wondering if it will replace our jobs. This creates a reinforcing dynamic where more people go to check out the tool. 
If we think about the act of hacking, it's the constructing a tool or system to its component parts to learn the individual pieces and then putting it back together again in a new way. This is exactly how the human brain works during the learning process. We need to create time that encourages learners to explore what they find interesting and to share that with others. Again, this is what hackers do. They seek to find vulnerabilities for things that could or should be different. Then they share their findings. 2. Training must be failure-driven. It's all fun and games until you show up at work as a cat. Watching Texas lawyer Rod Punton attend a civil forfeiture case hearing over Zoom with a cat filter on is one of the most iconic, if not hilarious, moments of the pandemic. In February 2021, late-night comics pilloried Mr. Ponton for his inability to understand how to use the technology, knowing neither how the cat filter got turned on or, more importantly, how to turn it off. It's impossible to watch that clip without laughing, despite the perfunctory nature of the hearing. At one point, Mr. Ponton assures the court that he is, in fact, quote, here live, I'm not a cat, unquote. After about a minute, Ponton removed the filter and returned to business. Herein lies the power of digital technology and the pitfall of not having the requisite literacies. But it's also a useful educative moment for Mr. Ponton, who presumably learned how to turn off the cat filter when starting a Zoom call, or at least to check if it's on before launching Zoom. So his failure created a learning moment where he, and hopefully we, will never forget. One of the flashiest pieces of Silicon Valley jargon to make its way into the corporate lexicon is failing fast. It refers to a startup tech company's ability to develop something, test it out, and abandon it quickly if it doesn't work. In Silicon Valley, failing fast is a badge of honor and something to be celebrated. In fact, Alphabet takes huge pride in the fact that most of its products are failures. Circles, Wave, Orkut, Hangout, Answers, Dodgeball, Notebook, and many more. Eliminating the fear of failure paves the way to learn and increase digital competency. The Super Mario Effect YouTube science sensation and former NASA engineer Mark Roper did a 2015 TED Penn talk entitled The Super Mario Effect, Tricking Your Brain into Learning More. Roper invited his followers to play a simple game he created that claimed to teach anyone to program. He didn't tell the 50,000 people who played that this was an experiment. When users completed the game, they were randomly shown one of two messages. One read simply, please try again. The other was, that didn't work. You lost five points. You now have 195 points. Please try again. The points were fake, contained no value, and were not shared with anyone else. However, the difference in the messaging produced two dramatically different outcomes. 68% of people who saw the no penalty message completed the challenge. However, only 52% of the people who lost five points per failure finished the challenge. He points out that the non-penalized users tried the puzzle two and a half more times, thus increasing the learning process. Rober uses the above findings as an opportunity to reframe the learning process as a video game, specifically Super Mario Brothers. He argues that when playing a video game, failures are part of the learning process, and users accept them as part of the experience. The failures lead to one learning after another, jump here, duck there, run faster, and so on. He points out that when in life, the real world goes awry, failure and doubt start to creep in. Instead, he extols people to keep their focus on the end game, in this case, saving the princess, and for each of life's challenges to treat them like video games. By doing this, it shifts the focus to the game and not how dumb one might look. The authors of Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning, provide scientific evidence to support Rober's claims. They blame Western culture for creating an environment where learners internalize errors as a marker of failure and believe they must be avoided at all costs. This is a dynamic that is often reinforced by instructors. The aversion to failure is reinforced by instructors who wrongly believe that when, quote, learners are allowed to make errors, it's the errors that they'll learn, unquote. They go on to point out that this poisons experimentation and risk-taking, which are crucial for the learning process. Even worse, this can seep into the subconscious to the point where you're spending more effort avoiding mistakes and failure instead of solving the problems to build learning capacity. 
taken together in a corporate environment where failing fast is not part of the culture, this creates a reinforcing effect. People fear failing and set their objectives to what they can achieve comfortably. Rober argues that failure should be a badge of honor and a driver to continue attacking the problem by using different solution techniques. It's a journey of learning exploration instead of a rote answer or empty calorie learning. If we agree that failing is how we learn digital skills, then the logical conclusion is that we should include failure as a KPI. We should be able to highlight what we attempted, what we failed, and why, and quantify it. This gets us down the path of activity versus productivity. Producing activity is simply a series of safe actions designed to show that one has been actively engaged doing tasks, regardless of efficacy. But there's no guarantee that any of those actions net any value for the enterprise or the employee. This is marked by employees who want to complicate discussions, talk endlessly about a project, or postpone taking action basically what middle managers do when they kill digital transformations. By comparison, if we look at productivity, that is a series of actions that add value. Oftentimes, the value is created from failing. Consider 99% of a hacker's work can be regarded as a failure, but each step along the path is very productive because it's enumerating the defenses and finding vulnerabilities until they finally break through and land on a vulnerability to exploit. Three. Training must provide reflection time. A key part of learning is reflection, taking time to ask the questions of what went well, what could have gone better, and why. In military circles, this is known as the debrief. B-2 stealth bomber pilot Bill Crawford did a TED Talk in which he recounted his time flying a 36-hour nonstop mission from Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri all the way to Baghdad, Iraq, and back without landing. He recounts doing that mission landing and going straight into a debrief. He breaks down the mission as 39% time spent planning, 58% in mission execution, and 3% in debriefing. Despite the disparity in time, he asserts that the debrief is where the learning and improvement comes from. Their debriefs consisted of five questions. One, what happened? Two, what went right? Three, what went wrong? Four, why? Five, what can we learn from this? He describes the debrief as where the true learning takes place. Further, he explains that his squadron set up an egalitarian culture free from blame or judgment where ego is left behind, and the only thing that matters is learning from mistakes, practicing, and getting better. U.S. fighter pilot Mark Fogel describes a similar debrief process in which his squadron spends hours reviewing performance data for 10 minutes of actual action. What is sad and shocking is that corporate training lacks any time for reflection, opting for scale, repeatability, and error-free outcomes. If we are going to truly train people in risk management or supply chain more broadly, we need to do deep dive case studies into the major security breaches and take the time to process and internalize them. Four, training must be generative. Entrepreneur and self-proclaimed evildoer Jeff Jonas ran an experiment with his girlfriend's son and cousins at a party. He bought five 300-piece jigsaw puzzles for the kids to solve. However, he made some alterations. Puzzle one, he removed 30 pieces, leaving 270 out of 300. Puzzle two, he removed 100 pieces, leaving 200 out of the 300. Puzzle three, he removed 150 pieces, leaving 150 out of 300. Puzzle 4, he removed 294 pieces, leaving 6 out of 300. Puzzle 5 was a copy of Puzzle 1 where he removed 270 pieces, leaving 30 out of 300. He then mixed them all together and dropped them on a table, telling the kids nothing of his malfeasance. It took the kids 22 minutes before they figured out there was a duplicate. At 35 minutes, they realized that some of the pieces were missing. At 37 minutes, they started to determine some of the imagery. People sitting on a porch playing a banjo, a scene from puzzle number three, the one with half the pieces missing. At two hours and 10 minutes, the kids realized that there were four puzzles, and at two hours and 18 minutes, they figured out that it was four puzzles with a few random pieces thrown in. This was a gigantic exercise in generative learning. Jonas didn't have to tell the kids what the problem was. They thought they were solving a jigsaw. But in the process, he was helping them build context generation skills of observation. Most learning management systems are the opposite of generative learning. They start by providing the answer and then quiz you on whether you read it. 
In generative learning, the goal is to find that aha moment, such as when the kids realize that the jigsaw challenge was much more than simply putting together a puzzle. Learning digital is all about finding that aha moment, successfully making the API connection, getting the database to return what you were looking for, or simply having the information at your fingertips with the press of a button. This happens because we teach the brain to struggle with the technical challenge over time until we achieve that moment of clarity. Then the repetition randomly over time keeps it present. Solving incomplete puzzles that require research, observation, pattern building, and social collaboration is what underpins highly popular alternate reality games, ARGs. According to Wired contributing editor Clive Wilson, quote, ARGs are designed to be clue-cracking, multi-platform scavenger hunts, unquote. ARGs are often used for promotional ploys, such as movies, television shows, books, and other consumer products. What makes ARGs relatively unique is that they are free to play and don't require special equipment like video games. So there are low barriers to entry. They're great for collaborative problem solving in that a cryptic clue is dropped. Then you work together to scour the online world and all types of media to uncover more clues and solve the mystery, or as Wilson notes, find signals in the noise. Non-technical users will quickly learn new digital skills such as scraping and algorithmic text analysis to comb through the noise and make connections. Social collaboration and rewards are key to this as users build street cred among the community. All these dynamics are self-reinforcing in that one success leads to another, which motivates users to keep going. Training must be personal. We are not robots. It is important to understand that teaching humans is different than teaching machines. We'll talk about training them later. While that may sound obvious, consider how corporate training is communicated or dictated. Training programs are usually announced as a detached task. Quote, you must complete this course by a certain date, unquote with requisite follow-up notifications until the task is completed. Or the training requirement is communicated as part of a digital transformation whereby employees are supposed to complete a predefined list of classes in a mandatory or semi-mandatory set of meticulously tracked learning objectives or pathways. Then training plans are laid out and progress measured as part of job performance. This is all fine except that human learning is impacted by the human condition. If people are sick, stressed due to a deadline, just had a fight with their spouse, worried about their kids, or under other similar pressure, their ability to learn will be affected. These external variables will further influence the learning experience with the content. In other words, learning is a key part of the human experience and is improved by cultural and social factors. For learning to truly stick, each learner needs the content to be personalized to them. The learning objective must be for the individual to extract the key ideas and internalize them into a mental model that works for them. To do this, there must be a steady accumulation of knowledge and relevance to one's life experience. This allows the learner to reflect on and mentally rehearse how it applies to a particular situation or debrief on the lessons learned. Naturally, this creates a scale problem. When an enterprise needs to train anyone from 50,000 to 200,000 employees, the question is, how do we personalize training at that scale? Successful learning occurs when new material is presented in a personalized manner, followed by frequent quizzes of that material offered up at random times. This forces the learner to reach back and apply previously learned information, interweaving two or more topics and randomness. A key tenet of learning is knowing what you will be doing with knowledge later. If you want to break into someone's website or physical building, you're going to undertake a series of learnings based on that singular objective. Too many corporate learning objectives are designed for mass consumption and focused on the least common denominator. If you know the objective is to get me to click on a link to install malware, you must start by learning anything and everything you can about me. Me clicking the email is the objective that the mental model builds on, and the retrieval of all information will be in support of that. Sidebar, gamification is not the answer. Do an RFP for corporate training and inevitably the term gamification will come up in the responses. It's used as an umbrella term to imply that assigning rewards and points will create meaningful and sustained engagement. Gamification terms gained popularity in the corporate training realm after Dan Tapscott and Anthony D. Williams' book, Wikinomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything. Wikinomics pushed organizations to harness the power of the crowd, especially those outside the enterprise itself. 
It spurred companies to become good at collaboration. Gamification quickly became core to increasing and sustaining collaboration. Terms like leaderboards, ratings, badges, voting, and the like quickly emerged. Almost overnight, every app, tool, and initiative became quote-unquote gamified to promote team collaboration, motivation, and engagement. Yet those promises remain unfulfilled. Gamification has long been applied to the educational realm. Older folks like myself will remember the analog reading contest during elementary school where everyone in the class was encouraged to compete to see who could read the most books. Younger folks may remember accelerated learner programs, which took this to the digital realm. In both versions, the goal is to get kids to read more, which is laudable. So kids pick books based on their progress and quizzes. In return, readers are rewarded with public accolades, levels, progress indicators, and so on, and given recommendations for additional books. This is using gamification to get students to read more. The problem is that the whole model is based on increasing the consumption of books, so it pushes the students to do what the teacher or administrator or parent wants, but doesn't build a love of reading. As long as you can answer the quiz questions at the end, you move along. We read to the quiz not to foster a love of reading. Does this sound familiar? This is the problem with corporate training, say cyber training, where we're working to pass the quiz to check the box and not learning anything about protecting the enterprise. Imagine a young sixth grade student who didn't particularly enjoy reading or doing schoolwork. The teacher, let's call her Miss Reynolds, put the student in one of these analog reading contests where students were required to do a write-up for each book they read. As it turns out, our student was out sick for a whole week just after the reading contest started. Alone, at home, and bored, this was pre-internet, this student started thinking about how they could participate in the reading contest without actually taking the time to read the books. It occurred to them that all they needed to do was read the synopsis on the back, rewrite it in their own words, and submit that as evidence of having read the book. That student handed in 12 of these and won the contest, having read none of the books and absorbed absolutely nothing from the exercise. This is the problem with gamification. We simply try to solve for what the game master designed instead of learning. Gamification gives the supposed learner the illusion of choice, but they are simply choosing from a predetermined set of options created by the game master. The learner doesn't learn. They simply operate within the constructs of the artificial game, and the more enterprising users will try to reverse engineer or even hack the game to see if they can outwit both the game and the game master. Like our hypothetical sixth grader, or me, when I take my two annual cybersecurity trainings. Further, gamification assumes that everyone within the enterprise will compete for badges, recognition, and non-monetary rewards as a way of driving activity in an LMS or even adoption of a new tool. But this lacks a proper incentive structure. There is a difference between Starbucks offering me 20 bonus stars if I order three days in a row or I will get the reward of a free drink versus taking seemingly useless training courses simply to get a virtual badge next to my name on a site that nobody visits. Teaching people to spearfish. Let's bring the social, failure-driven, reflective, generative, personalized learning concepts together to meet a learning objective, supply chain cybersecurity. I started this chapter by pointing out the futility of cybersecurity training as it is done today. I propose reversing the training paradigm by applying the learning methodologies above and digital competencies to this problem. Instead of reading about what makes a suspicious email, why do we not train people to write phishing emails? This is the modern equivalent of saying, quote, if you give a person a fish, they eat for a day, but if you teach them the fish, they eat forever, unquote. When you explain what suspicious emails look like, you're giving that person a fish, Instead, we need to teach people to fish, or more specifically, we need to teach them how to spearfish. Spearfishing is a very targeted attack that attempts to trick a user into giving up their account credentials or allows for impersonating them. Successful spearfishing or cyber compromise anywhere in the supply chain puts every tier and node at risk because of the implied trust therein. 
as described in the SolarWinds attack. The targeted spear phishing attack uses information about the person to make the notification more personalized. A money-making offer from the Crown Prince of Nigeria is probably not legitimate. Similarly, a notification that I won the lottery is equally suspicious. Why? I don't play the lottery and I know that Nigeria is a federal republic consisting of 36 states, that dynastic titles vary by subregion, none of which is prince. Here's an example of how vulnerable humans are to spear phishing. Let's take Jane, a bookkeeper at Acme Electronics. Acme Electronics makes wiring harnesses that go into nearly every printed circuit board. They would be a tier 4 supplier to most high-tech companies or a tier 5 supplier for automotive companies. Jane is vegan, likes high-end fashion, and has a dog. If I want to disrupt a large automotive company, I simply trace their supply chain down to Acme Electronics. Then I looked on LinkedIn for who is their bookkeeper. Then I friend Jane. I find her on Facebook and see if I can get to her through a friend of a friend to learn as much about her as possible. If all else fails, I can purchase her core personal identifying information, assuming Google doesn't just feed it to me, such as address, phone number, and email. I can also purchase web browsing history from Jane's neighborhood through a data broker. Then I simply de-anonymize the data to see where Jane has browsed and transacted on the internet. Yes, it's that easy. I write a phishing email offering a vegan dog food and get her to click on the link. When she does that, I can compromise her computer. Once I've compromised her computer, I can compromise other Acme computers because Acme is trusted by the next supplier, ABC Systems. And I can continue with the next provider up the food chain until I get all the way up to the prize target. Even if I don't make it to the high value target, compromising a tier one supplier and changing the banking information could easily net me a couple million dollars. This could have catastrophic effects for the tier one supplier and a original equipment manufacturer, OEM, who might have to provide the money to fill the gap. Let's test your knowledge. If you wanted to spearfish me, how would you approach it? I've left plenty of clues throughout the text and footnotes. In fact, feel free to attempt to spearfish me after you read this book. Building cybersecurity awareness and capability should be a pleasurable experience because it's something that helps all of us in our personal lives as much as our work lives. So theoretically, this is a win-win, yet we screw it up by dumbing down the content. Cybersecurity is getting worse and learning how to protect ourselves should be something useful instead of a corporate mandate. Digital competencies are exactly the same. How do we help people build digital competencies? The short answer is we don't have the learning tools we need. Consider that digital is learned through the act of doing. And doing means talking to others, sharing ideas, exploring the art of the digital possible, testing software, attending conferences, and just about any other activity that is in the realm of exploration and experimentation and embracing these topics. Escape rooms are a great way to teach people crucial problem-solving skills, and they meet the pedagogical elements identified above, social, failing, filling in gaps, and reflection. Eventually, I predict we will have digital escape rooms that challenge people to employ and reinforce learning of key digital concepts. ARGs, as described above, have all the hallmarks for learning and applying digital skills. They need to be adapted and applied to the corporate environment. Most importantly, they need to be personalized to an audience of one. People reach out to me all the time asking for the recommendation for the best kind of tool for this or that. I always sidestep the question using a highly specialized consulting evasion technique. Instead, I give them a list of all the providers I know and encourage them to talk to them and do the evaluation themselves. I do this because I'm not in the business of crowning winners and losers. That's a fool's errand and something that should be stopped, but won't because there's too much money to be made. What works for one healthcare company won't work for another. I want every organization to build the muscle to do the evaluations themselves. That is how we grow digital competency. If we're simply relying on the analysts and consultants, then we're offloading a key literacy development to people who aren't invested in the outcome. The question that follows is, how do I hear about all these tools or where do I go to find out about them? That is a question I love and answer vociferously. My recommendation is to talk to a vast swath of people. 
talk to competitors, non-competitors, founders, venture capitalists, influencers, or anybody who writes about these topics. Attend conferences, build new connections, talk to speakers and panelists, run digital immersion sessions. When you speak to people individually or in small groups, you can ask questions or hear specifics that underpin stories. Doing this reinforces the stories and lessons you learn. This is what it means to do digital. To summarize, if we truly want to upskill people, we need to incentivize them to learn. Learning is an emotional investment. We have to stop pretending that error-proof web-based training teaches people anything. Why should I waste my time on cybersecurity training that will not increase my knowledge? This is disrespectful to the employee. We need to make the learning goal authentic and meaningful. That motivation matched with deep knowledge will increase one's creativity and aptitude to solve complicated problems. These skills are what hackers embody. This is the approach we need to deliver to our supply chain professionals because this is how we will prepare for, improve, and secure our next generation supply chains. With these learning principles in mind, we can go about the task of creating new trainings that help us to learn digital by doing, much like the spear phishing example above. This means building entirely new curriculums and incentive structures. At a minimum, we can stop buying useless learning management systems. This alone will save millions of dollars. I had one client tell me they spent $25 million on a new learning management system. I almost fell out of my chair. Hacking people, five takeaways. One, stop pretend training and instead motivate employees to learn. Two, leaders need to eliminate the fear of failure and embrace it as part of the learning process. Three, create social learning experiences among teams both internally and externally. Four, maximize retention of new concepts and provide time to reflect. Five, allow employees to feel comfortable about not having all the answers. Mm-hmm.